Brightwater, an expedition of nature. Part 1. Grasses The grasses of Brightwater are hardened survivors. They have survived negative 40 degrees Celsius winters with feet of snow. They live through months of sweltering sunlight with little rain. Through the many years of their existence, they have adapted to the sandy soil they live on. Though many types of grass are found amongst the prairie, the most abundant is the needle and thread grass. Part 2. Plants The plants of Brightwater truly are one of its greatest features. All of them have helped shape the world we know today. They've evolved so they can survive prairie winters. They expand their roots so when they freeze, they stay intact. Many plants can even grow in different terrains. Plants such as the Indian breadroot moved community. First Nation would move kilometers just for one plant. In the middle of the forest, you look up. You see sunlight peeking through the green leaves of the birch tree nearby. Some of these birch trees have protected the forest floor from the elements for over a hundred years. Trees such as the aspen provide natural sunscreen for those around it. That's how it survives the scorching hot weather. All of the trees in the prairie are mountains in the land of flat. Part 4. Prairies A hefty amount of Saskatchewan is covered with sandy prairies. One of its many characteristics are the wide area of grass with little trees. In history, this land was sought after for agricultural purposes. The dry non-arable land was used for animal agriculture. The arable land was used for a wide variety of crop farming. This was what brought settlers to Saskatchewan. Part 5. Forest Around the Brightwater area, there is a small forest. Many of these small forest clusters are spread far and wide across Saskatchewan. Here is where many small plants and towering trees call home. Things such as lichen and moss flourish on this forest floor. Part 6. Creek In the heart of Whitewater dwells a creek. landscape is moist and full of life. Bank swallows and endangered species create their burrows in the side of the creek. Small creeks like the one at Brightwater are found everywhere in Saskatchewan. The plant I learned a lot about was the barred horsetail, or the nail file plant. It only files your nails when rubbed horizontally and can fix you up if you're trying to impress a male rescue pilot. The topography of the land has a huge influence over what plants and animals live in the vicinity of spoken contact, because certain plants can only grow on certain types of soil. Like for example, there weren't many pine trees in the middle of the forest, and there were quite a few on the outside. This may have something to do with the types of ground in the dark, shaded parts of the forest and the unshaded, bright parts of the forest. Also, the types of plants affect the different types of animals that live there, because some types of plants aren't suitable for nesting of some types of birds or they aren't edible. So really, when you think about it, all of nature is connected because something as small as the soil and the ground can affect where birds migrate 
and types of mammals live in the area. In the first picture, a gazebo, but that is not what your attention should be turned to. I want you to look at the native grasses below the gazebo, such as gamma, needle, and thread grasses. These native grasses are different from the Kentucky blue grass that is found in most yards. And this is the wolf willow. The wolf willow is a shrub found in the open prairie that has white berries. Most white berried plants are poisonous. However, this exception can heal some ailments. It is also known as a survival berry because of the berry's density. In this area, there are a lot of hills that I can only assume were from the time of the last ice age. This picture is of a steep and sandy path leading down to the bottom of one of these hills. In this picture, you can also see a beige grass poking out of the side of the path. Now, while I'm unsure on the name, it looks kind of like a wheat, or a blade of wheat, or however I say it, I don't know. Anyways, moving on to the next picture. And here we can see a fallen trembling aspen. Now, normally these plants have a natural sunscreen on them, but since this one has fallen and dead, well, I don't think it can produce it anymore. These plants are very, very beautiful when they are grown. Here we can see a tent caterpillar nesting in a tree. Now, tent caterpillars are unique because their cocoons are woven with silk, and they get their name because they look like tents. These cocoons are special only to them, and I have not seen another caterpillar try to attempt this. In this picture, there is a tree with a toxic orange moss growing on it. Since I got a picture of the trunk, it is hard to tell what type of tree it is. I still think it is beautiful, though. In this picture, we can see a flowering plant. Now, this flowering plant was attached to a tree, but I wasn't sure which one it was. I do think these white flowers are very pretty, though, and there were bees in the area, which means that they are getting pollinated. In the second picture, we can see a sort of a marigold-like flower with a pinkish hinge. For my final picture in the forest section, the bog violet. I mean the tree star. I mean the bog violet. The bog violet is the tiny purple flower in the corner. Now these flowers have special leaves that help funnel rain to the base of the plant. This is cool because it helps the plant survive in drier conditions. Now starting with the first picture in the creek area, we can see a mossy clump in the middle of what appears to be a natural spring. Now, these natural springs are important, and especially if you're lost in the woods. All civilization is built around water, so if you go with the flow, you can get back to civilization if you're lost. In this picture, we can see the creek. I think it is very pretty. We can also see the reflection. I would like to take this time to talk about some more topography. Most areas in the native plains are very dry. This means that the plants have to be very hardy. The soil is also not the best in the native uncultivated areas. So the native plants have longer roots to reach water. They also need less nutrition to survive than most other plants. These plants are truly superheroes of the natural prairie. In this picture, there's a beaver dam. Speaking of beavers, did you know that beavers have to poop in the water? This would have affected any First Nations living in the vicinity of a beaver dam before the settlers arrived. Because the water will most likely contain the bacteria from their poop. These people who drank the water would get the beaver fever. For my final picture, I don't want you to look at any plants. I want you to look at the erosion that's happening in the creek. Now, this erosion is happening because water is running down the mud. 
In many places near this area of the creek, if you walk on it, it will collapse underneath you, which is why there are bars preventing you from going down to the creek. Hello, and welcome to my video on the pictures I took at Brightwater. I will be telling you about the pictures I took, as well as some information on the things I took pictures of. Before we get started, I must thank Alex for this picture, although if I were to take it again, I would have included the top of my head. It's still a great picture, though. Now, let's get started. This is a section on grasslands like the one we were in. In this picture, I tried to get a perspective on which the building would be in a place so that people would notice it, yet not focus just on it, as the other parts of the picture are important as well. This picture is one in which I actually wanted to include something that wasn't natural, the road. I included it for contrast against the natural grassland all around it, and also because it looks nice when you look at it. This picture shows that not all grassland is flat, and that it can be pretty dynamic at times, which can be pretty cool sometimes. The grassland is also very teeming with grasses and flowering plants, with soil that's a bit dry, due to not many clouds and the sun drying it out. This part focused on the forests of bright water. Now, everybody likes views, which is exactly what I wanted the audience to see in this picture. You can see many parts of the forest here, as well as the horizon in the distance. You can also see the sand that is right next to the creek. However, not the creek itself, as you already observe. This picture shows a path. This is one of the more deeper pictures I took as an analogy that you never really know what you find around the corner. But you should go there anyway to find out. The irony is I do actually know where this goes, the eco-center. As my final forest picture, this one represents that the forest is thick and that you'll probably not be able to simply walk through it like in movies. They make it look like there's usually enough space to walk through without trouble, but the plants usually grow very close together. You may also notice that the soil is not as dry because the trees block the sun and prevent it from drying out the soil in most forest areas. Welcome to the creek section where the photos depict the creek. This nice picture is one where I got the effect of taking it a bit far away and not on the bridge. So the bridge, like in some other photos I took, adds some nice contrast to the photo's natural feel. In this one, I added the same effect that something in the picture is close to you, in this case a tree, and the main focus is on the thing in the background. Other than that, the photo is pretty normal. However, the creek provides a home for the bank swallows, in this picture, I tried to get a different perspective on the creek. However, James got in the way, so I had to crop him out. Originally, this would have been the photo, but like I said, I cropped it. It's not like it's a bad photo with James in the way, but I had to crop him out for this project. This section is all about the grasses that we saw. This picture is just of grass. However, keep in mind that I only took three pictures of just grass in particular, so I didn't really have any other options. In this picture, there is one or two, maybe more grasses, along with some flowering plants. As far as I can tell, grasses don't have too complicated features or processes. The roots are about normal, and I don't think they need very many vitamins. Again, this picture shows many grasses, as well as some flowering plants and trees in the distance. I tried to get a perspective that captures what I want to get, but also the horizon and a bit of the sky. In this portion, I will be talking about trees. In this photo, you can see some moss and lichen on the tree. Lichen is pretty cool because you can actually eat it when you're stuck in the forest. Now moss, on the other hand, is not edible. Now this perspective is a bit different, of course, but other than that, you of course see some sort of stuff on the tree. That is a fungus growing on the tree. I'm not entirely sure what exactly it is doing there, but
but it would make sense that the fungus would steal the tree's vitamins and minerals, so that's a possibility. For this photo, I wanted a picture that would get a good view of the sky, but also that captures how majestic the tree is, and maybe also includes a couple other plants. And so this was the result. There's not very much to tell about trees because we already know how they work. Photosynthesis roots and the leaves absorb the sun and rain. For this section, I will discuss my flowering plant photos. Now, this is just a photo of some plants. Now, flowering plants work in many different ways. They can have very large collections of roots. They can live without much vitamins or minerals. They can be big and get lots of sun. They can grow in places near water or where there aren't many clouds. There are many ways plants can adapt. For this picture, I thought the view was pretty nice, and also that there are a lot of varieties of plants here, so I took the picture. Overall, there are lots of plants I still remember from the trip, like the nail file plant, the marshmallow plant, the root beer plant, I don't remember the actual names of any of them, and of course, pasture sage, the plant I learned about. A bit of a funny story about this picture. At first, when I got it on my computer, I honestly couldn't tell what it was. A view of the forest, or plants. I found out that it was just plants by looking at it for a while. But when you look at it from a different perspective, it sort of does look like trees. For this section, I will discuss my other photos. This photo is probably my favorite in the whole project because that sky just looks so cool. I really like it the way I got that shining effect. Even though this is just a different perspective of the same picture, I really like it. It symbolizes a lot of different things, most of which I like. I know what you're thinking. This one could have been forced, but it also represents grassland, grasses, trees, and maybe some flowering plants. That's pretty much all of them. You might be able to see the creek. Anyway, I put it in this section because I couldn't decide what section it was part of. I also really like it. That's the end of my project. Thank you for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed it. This is my Brightwater photo story. Enjoy. The plants of the prairie are extremely tough. They have adapted to live through extreme temperature change. In the winter, they survive minus 40 degrees Celsius temperatures and lie under three feet of snow. Then, each summer, these plants live under a baking sun at 30 degrees Celsius with little to no water. In the days where the wild buffalo grazed the prairie, the plants were trampled here. The buffalo truly influenced how the prairie was shaped. I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. The trees of the forest are so smart. They follow the light. When they need some more, they take up at night. When there's too much, they put on the sunblock to keep from getting burnt. The forests are important because they provide us with the necessary resources to all life forms. Air. Without the forest, we cannot survive. The forests also provide homes to many animals. In the forest, there is extreme life diversity and the soil is very rich. Because of the rich soil, more trees are starting to grow, changing the lay of the land. I learned a while ago that water is the way to go. Why not go with the flow? The creek is a beautiful place. Without it, we wouldn't be here. It's a very necessary resource and it's a beautiful one too. Without it, there would be no plants, no animals, or humans. It provides homes for the beautiful bank swallow. Without these banks, they would not be here either. We have to try to stop the banks from collapsing and destroying their habitat. When water is near, it makes its own path, not caring what is its way. This is where erosion comes into play. Carving grooves in sandy bays. Over the years, the creek has caused the edges of the banks to fade away. See what the creek was like a hundred years ago. The creek provides a source of water for all who need it. This creek is very old. Did you know the older a creek is, the more whining it will be? Grasses of the prairie sway with the wind. They grow alone or in clumps to save the soil from eroding away. Without them, the prairie could be a desert or a barren wasteland. They trap the moisture in the soil. Some of them are so special that they keep your nails filed. Some of the native prairie grasses had their seeds trampled into the ground by the buffalo so they could reproduce. 
Not all grasses like being grazed over by the buffalo. Now that the buffalo do not graze the prairies, the grasses that needed to be trampled have started to disappear. Shrubs and trees that live close together have lived in harmony for almost forever. Their beautiful colors make for a good landscape painting, almost just like a sunset. From prairie sage to everyday oak trees, they keep your eye intrigued all day. The trees and shrubs gave the native people medicines. The forest was like their everyday pharmacy. Flowering plants show plenty in color, from white to purple to orange. So many of them to look at, I don't even know where to start. The flowers we see are very beautiful, but they can be dangerous. As Mother Nature shows, almost everything that is brightly colored, you should leave alone. They can give you a nasty stomach ache and make you lose your mind. You can even die. If you ever lost in the wilderness, please like the lichen. It's nice and green and it grows on trees and it's good for you and me. It will keep you healthy and full. Just don't eat the orange lichen. Lichen is important because it is a good survival food that the native people could have eaten. When near the prairie, there are lots of animals and bugs to see. There are baby barn swallows and pollinating bees. Even everyday robins just enjoying the breeze. Thank you for listening. Most people assume prairies are flat and boring. And, well, they are flat but they're definitely not boring. In our bright water trip, I learned so much about the things that are around us, and it was such a cool experience to see everything firsthand. In my photo story, I'm going to be talking about many things, including how the First Nations people use some of the plants, which animals eat what plants, and how this land is formed. I don't want to take too much time away from it, so here it is, my bright water photo story. I'm going to be starting off with the prairie, because it's everywhere. A prairie is a large or open area of grassland, and you'll soon find out why. The formation of the North American prairie started with the last glacial advance, 110,000 years ago. This caused the glaciers expanding southward to scrape the landscape, leveling the terrain, hence the flatness. The Rocky Mountains then created a rain shadow that killed most of the trees. The prairie has changed a lot since then, though. The tall grass prairie has evolved over the many years, with disturbances like grazing of bison, elk, and deer. Also, a small percentage of the original land cover of the fire remains because of agriculture. First Nations would use fire annually as a tool to assist in hunting, safety, and transportation. Fire started from either lightning or people could remove trees, clear dead plant matter, and change the soil from the ash produced. Native prairie plants have deep roots to help them reach water even in the driest conditions. These plants suffered much less damage than the farm crops currently grown. Now I'll be talking about some grasses you'll find on the prairie. Some grasses found at Brightwater include needle and thread grass, blue grammar grass, western wheat grass, smooth brome, fringe brome, leafy spurge, and canary grass. Other grasses found in southern Saskatchewan include porcupine, weed, fescue, blue stem, drop seed, rice, and bluegrass. Animals like sheep, cattle, horses, and rabbits eat grass, as well as many invertebrates such as grasshoppers and caterpillars. Depending on the culture, grasses like sage, sweetgrass, cedar, juniper, lavender, and wild tobacco are used in smudging ceremonies for many different reasons, such as cleansing, purifying thoughts, eliminating negative thoughts, and thinking wisely. This picture is of canary grass. First Nations people used it for making baskets after it was bleached and dried in the sun. Birds are attracted to the seed, but canary grass has alkaloids that discourage animals from eating it. It also has a coarse stem, which makes it difficult to eat. When you're in bright water, you're sure to see many flowers, as I did. My favorite flower was wild blue flax, mainly because of the color, but it can also be white or yellow. It was used medicinally by First Nations people for anything from coughs to pimples to diarrhea. The petals were also often used in children's crafts. Wild blue flax flowers have seeds, flax seeds, which are super nutritious and healthy, but shouldn't be eaten raw. Eating flax seed reduces the risk of cancer and many other diseases. 
It also promotes strong hair, nails, bones, teeth, and healthy skin. It was used for string, mats, snowshoes, fishing nets, and baskets. Birds also love eating flaxseed, so it is often used to draw them to their gardens. If you've been to Alberta, you probably recognize this flower because it's on their license plate. This is a wild rose, and it's a native species of the Canadian and American Great Plains. These pink petals can be eaten raw or cooked, and the shoots can also be peeled and eaten raw. The roots and stems were used to make medicine, and the inner bark is a tobacco. When bees drink the nectar of the flower and pollinate it, they turn into rose hips. You can make tea or jam out of the rose hips, and some First Nations use green rose hips to make toy pipes for children, or they are strung together to make necklaces. They are sought after by birds, rabbits, bears, squirrels, and humans. This next flower is wild mustard. It was brought over to North America, so First Nations didn't have it to use for anything. It's a weed and it can take over crops, such as canola and spring cereals. The flowers are a prime source of pollen and nectar, so they attract pollinating insects. The seed of this plant can be dried, ground, and used as a spice, and with the right machines it makes oil. The oil is used for making soap and cooking. In Europe, they often eat the leaves like a leafy vegetable, even though the plant can be irritating to some people's skin, eyes, and noses. Horses, cows, and goats will eat it if it's in a crop somewhere randomly. The last flower is a Canada anemone flower. This wild flower has no fruit or seeds, and the flower isn't edible because it's poisonous. It's avoided by herbivores because it'll cause blistering on contact, so it does attract bees and flies. The First Nations use the plant for wounds, sores, nosebleeds, and as eye wash. The root was highly respected among them and was used for many elements and greatly valued medicines. I'm now going to be talking about the forest because many people don't realize that forests cover over half of Saskatchewan, so they're a big part of this land as well. Forests also cover a third of the Earth's land, but there are many different kinds, such as tropical, temperate, and montane. The main one in Saskatchewan is Boreal. A forest is a constantly changing environment made up of many living things, including wildlife, trees, shrubs, wildflowers, ferns, mosses, lichens, and fungi, and a variety of non-living things like water, rocks, sunlight, air, and nutrients. One can form anywhere the plant and animal life can thrive without disruption. You can see a lot of wildlife there if you're quiet enough. I saw a bull, a baby chipmunk, and a muskrat, but other animals in forests include bears, minks, river otters, moose, and beavers. There are many different trees that are at Brightwater, and a few common ones are spruce, balsam fir, jack pine, birch, trembling aspen, balsam poplar, and tamarack. First Nations people use trees for many things, including teepee posts for their shelter. Not unlike prairies, the forest is also changing. Deforestation, mainly for agriculture, is continuing at a high rate. Trees are the biggest part of forest, so I'm going to be talking about them next. This is a young trembling aspen tree. Trembling aspens have smooth, greenish-white-brown bark with round green leaves. Deer, moose, and elk eat young twigs and leaves, and snowshoe hares love to eat the bark. First Nations use aspen trees for many things. They would infuse the water with the bark of the tree and drink it for medicine, or infuse it with other tree barks. The bitter bark could be boiled or chewed for a strong medicine to cure a number of things, including earaches and insect bites. Also, the light wood was fashioned into teepee poles, canoe paddles, and bowls. The lime made from the aspen ashes and animal fat was turned into soap and used to prepare moose hides. This tree is dead. It's hard to tell, but it could have been an aspen, a poplar, or a cottonwood tree. They're all in the same family of trees, and they all have smooth bark and circular leaves. There are a number of ways it could have died. It could have died by fire, like I said before, so either by lightning or by people. It also could have been in the wrong location and not getting enough sunlight or water. Or it could have actually died of old age, which is complicated to explain, but it can happen to a tree. Of course, someone also could have cut it down with firewood, but it doesn't look like that's the case. 
The last tree is a birch tree. Birch trees have simple leaves, paper-like bark, and are often white. It's native to North America and is a perennial tree of Saskatchewan. Moose and deer eat the leaves and shoots. Porcupines like to eat the bark, rabbits will eat the seedlings, and various birds will peck little holes in the bark and feed on the sap. First Nations use the lightweight, flexible bark for things like canoes, baskets, cradles, bows, spoons, and bowls, and the sap of the tree could also be used as a medicine for colds. This is a robin, but you probably already knew that since it's a pretty common bird in North America. They eat anything from earthworms, caterpillars, and beetles to choke cherries and tomatoes. Female robins typically choose to nest on horizontal branches on trees, but will also nest in gutters, buildings, or other structures. The last thing I'll be talking about is the creek, because it's one of my favorite things about Brightwater, and everyone knows to say the best for last. Creeks get most of their water from rain or snow, and then it keeps going through the water cycle. They're usually formed by water flowing down to the lowest point, and on the way it erodes the soil so it becomes deeper and deeper, encouraging more and more water to keep draining into that area, forming a creek. The Brightwater Creek, or any creek, is very important because it's a major water source for animals. It also provides a home for animals like muskrats. Many plants also grow by the water, such as watercress. First Nations people would use creeks for water and transportation, and they always tried to camp near a water source like a creek. But water has been one of my favorite trips so far because I learned so much. I know I'll remember this trip forever. Everything about plants, the land, even how to use watercolors helped me better understand where we live.